Hey, James. Welcome to the His and Her Money Show. Thanks, Tyler. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me on. Glad to have you here because you've uh, created quite an incredible work um, that I feel like a lot of people should know more about. So I was super excited that you agreed to take some time and do this interview for the show. So for those who are unfamiliar with you, can you just take a moment and introduce yourself and let everybody know what you're all about? Absolutely. So I'm from Australia originally, so that's the uh, that's the accent. I spent 10 years in financial planning in Australia and spent five years after that on an entrepreneurial journey where I was involved in, in launching a number of products and companies. And most recently is author of Think and Grow Rich, The Legacy, which, which is a brand new book fully endorsed by the Napoleon Hill Foundation based on Think and Grow Rich, which is the best-selling self-help book of all time, written in 1937 by Napoleon Hill. And uh, the book Think and Grow Rich, The Legacy is the official book accompaniment to the multi-million dollar film, uh, also called Think and Grow Rich, The Legacy. So, I mean, you just mentioned that Think and Grow Rich is the uh, biggest self-help book sold in history uh, but some people don't know uh, what it's about or the story behind it so can you just uh, give us a little backstory on how Think and Grow Rich came about and Napoleon Hill's kind of efforts into this material? Yeah, well, Napoleon Hill was a young reporter from Wise County in Virginia growing up in an interesting time so during the First World War and then he released the book during the Great Depression. But Think and Grow Rich all stemmed from his encounter with a man by the name of Andrew Carnegie, who he was sent to interview when Napoleon Hill was a reporter. And Andrew Carnegie was a guy who'd come over to America from Scotland. He didn't have much to his name. And he had built himself up into being one of the wealthiest people in history, uh, created an amazing empire. And what Carnegie did was introduce him to numerous other people, uh, people like Henry Ford and Thomas Edison, people who were extremely successful. And what Napoleon Hill did was he interviewed more than 500 of the most accomplished people of all time and certainly of his era. And he was able to identify patterns and themes and commonalities in their success. So what he did was he collated those results in a book called Think and Grow Rich, which was his uh, achievement philosophy, which is 13 principles of success. But the most interesting thing about the book is that people, irrespective of background, financial starting point, age, gender, ethnicity, like whatever people came up with as, a, as an excuse to justify their circumstances, Napoleon Hill proved that those who succeed do so by using whatever they have in their possession, uh, possession, regardless of these perceived adversities or misfortunes. And in many cases, it was the adversity that stemmed them on to greater success and achieving their dreams and, and truly changing the world. So Think and Grow Rich went on to sell more than 120 million copies. It's a true timeless classic. And what we're trying to do with my new book, it's not a substitute or a replacement. It really is a modern companion to the original best-selling book. So how did you first come across these teachings and how did it affect you personally uh, throughout the course of your life? Well, I was, I was very, very young when I first read Think and Grow Rich. And I, I admit it didn't, really, it didn't really move me too much. I, was, I forget, I was maybe 14 or 15 years old. But a lot of the people who I interviewed for this project let me know a really interesting point. When you're reading any self-help material, all you can bring to it is your life experiences to that point. And that's why Bob Proctor, he reads Think and Grow Rich, the original, every single day and has done for the last 58 years. Sharon Lecter reads it every year. Rob Deerdeck reads it every couple of years. These people, they don't use Think and Grow Rich as a book and put it away. It's something that they study. So then when I picked up Think and Grow Rich, and I, I've always had a, a very strong passion and affinity for the self-help field. I grew up on a lot of people like Jim Rohn. They were huge inspirations and, and mentors to me through the written word and through their audio programs. So when it came time for me to revisit Think and Grow Rich in my early 20s, I was absolutely blown away. And then coming on board with this project, so I'm, I'm 34 now. And I've been reading Think and Grow Rich every day for the last two years since I came on board this project. And it really does have something on every single page that you could really dissect and, and really go into detail in a lot of hours on. So it, it's been a fantastic book and something that I think people need to uh, continuously read, not just once and then and then put away. Speaking of that, so you said it's something that you feel like people should con could sh should consistently read even today. I mean, some people might hear like, 1937 like you know what what is 
what do they know about what I'm going through in 2018, the, the pressure that I'm facing, the, the, I'm trying to figure out how to get my finances in order. I'm trying to figure out how to get my credit up. I'm trying to figure out just how to handle money. I, I don't know that much. Um, what would you say? Does the principles and the teachings apply to people like that dealing with these situations today? It's a it's a really good question. And I think if people go and read Think and Grow Rich, The Legacy, which is a new book that I have released, this one here, you will see that, and I actually mention it in the book, that Elon Musk, to me, is the personification of the entire achievement philosophy from Napoleon Hill. These principles stand the test of time. If anything, they're more relevant now than what they were back in the day. People can access anything, anything they want in their fingertips. So uh, people in the book that I reference are Sarah Blakely, the youngest self-made billionaire in the world, uh, the Navy SEALs, there's a hot, you know, football player, Tom Brady, there are so many different people, Oprah Winfrey, so many people mentioned through this, but I really wanted to try and illustrate that the book and the, the principles in particular, they are truly timeless because a lot of people on social media these days, they want to sell uh, a $5,000 course that sells them the secret to success. But every single person I interviewed for this project agreed that there is no secret to success. It is the consistent application of a proven set of success principles. That's what separates ordinary people from those who were able to have extraordinary achievement over time. I think that that's, that's a great point to, to stick with because I think a lot of times People know the right thing. Like, you know, if, if you're trying to lose weight, you need to eat the right foods and you need to exercise more. If you're trying to get your finances in order, you need to spend less than you make. Um, but sometimes the knowledge just stays at the point of receiving the knowledge and not necessarily the application of the knowledge. Um, how do we kind of break that that divide? Because sometimes people can listen to shows like this and hear your your advice and say, man, that's what I need to do. But then there's a disconnect between actually doing it. Um, how can people become better at not just acquiring the knowledge, but applying it? It's a, that's a really interesting point. That's one that I actually talk about in the book and in the, the speeches that I do today as well. It's the, the market doesn't care about how many PhDs or business degrees that you had. It means nothing. What matters is the product that you bring to market, how you look after your staff, how you look after your customers. I think people need to really get clear on what they want and they need to get out of their comfort zone and fo focus on increasingly becoming a person of value. I think that a lot of people, like like you mentioned with nutrition, they want to say, all right, from now on, no processed food, no junk food. I'm going to go 100% clean, like a complete detox off the bat. And it's difficult because it doesn't become a, a lifestyle habit. It's not something that they can that they can stick to. So I think people need to be not only realistic, they need to come up with goals, really figure out what it is they want, a lot of uh, what it is they want. A lot of people describe it as their why. Maybe if it's to get healthier, it's for your family or for your partner. If it's uh, to become financially independent, maybe that's so you can provide for your your family, maybe your kids' education. And th yeah, there is so much there is so much to this. And yeah, I think it's uh, a lot of people just need to focus on the little things and uh, too many people focus on the big complex trying to think that it's some secret. But if you focus on simple things and consistency, that is what really separates people over time. Focusing on consistency is key. It beats anything hands down. It's like the uh, what is it? The tortoise and the, the hare analogy. <laughs> and I know that you kind of touched on a little bit. Um, I think that when we're sitting here talking about they can grow rich the legacy your new book and people hear rich and they automatically think money but I think health plays a big part of that and I know part of your story is you have a pretty extensive background in health and fitness from an entrepreneurial standpoint but even in a into understanding how that plays a part in being rich so can you talk to that a little bit yeah I, I, I think there's nothing sadder than, than someone who's a billionaire or someone who's very very wealthy who sits in a giant mansion with these half a million dollar cars by themselves they've got no quality of life and nothing to show for it so yes money being rich is having the freedom to do whatever you want but think and grow rich many people misinterpret the title it's being rich in relationships it's waking up and thinking about what type of relationship that you want to have with your partner 
with your kids? What energy do you want to bring into the office when you come, when you face adversity? How are you going to feel about it? How are you going to handle it? Yeah, it's having a big balance because being financially rich is really important because it enables you to look after your friends and your family and your community and causes that you care about. But you need to be able to be uh, have your health, your mental health and your physical health in check as well because I think anyone who, you know, whenever you feel sick, it's that's the time when you feel like, oh, no, there is nothing more important than your own, than your own health. So, yeah, I, I really am, am big on preaching more of a, a holistic message. It's financial wealth by itself means nothing to me at all. It's having that balance, that alignment of having positive personal relationships, having your physical and your mental and your financial health all dialed in and leading by example for your family and for your community. A major thing that I saw uh, in reading your book was the importance of working hard to create a positive impact on the world. And one of the stories that really jumped out to me was uh, of the story of Sharon Lecter and I have personally been impacted by a lot of her work and I had no idea I was being impacted by a lot of her work because I had kind of attributed the work that she was doing to somebody else. So can you kind of share a little bit of her story and the importance of uh, the message that her father instilled in her about, you know, doing something good for for the other people? Definitely. So Sharon Lecter, uh, she talks about a big thing for her is that when she was young, her, her father said to her, how did you add value to someone's life today? And it's something that she still thinks about every single day. And it's interesting that the message of hard work, that comes across for all of them. That really is the secret ingredient. Lewis Howes, the quote from him that I, I got from this project, I think was uh, above all action every single day. David Meltzer, the CEO of Sports One Marketing says, one thing you will never do is outwork me. And the Sharon Lecter story, uh, she was actually, uh, I believe, a 50% partner in Rich Dad, the whole company that uh, have written dozens of books and created a board game called Cashflow. She's the co-author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and she's had all these amazing things. And a, a big part of her was that she kept the faith knowing that there was always going to be a next opportunity around the corner, even when she didn't know what that was. Because faith, that is one of the principles of Think and Grow Rich. And it was only when she had a disagreement with Robert Kiyosaki around the future of the business that she decided to leave the company. And it was then via that opportunity because her time was freed up. Not only did she get a call from Don Green, the executive director of the Napoleon Hill Foundation, asking her to collaborate on a number of projects. That was where she got involved with uh, very well-known books today, like Three Feet from Gold uh, with Greg Reed and Outwitting the Devil, which was based on a, a previous manuscript of Napoleon Hill. But Sharon also got a call from the office of then President uh, George W. Bush asking her to be on the, the president's financial literacy board, I forget the exact name of it, which was then carried through under the Obama administration and gave her an opportunity just to, to really thrive on financial literacy, which she does not only in her home state, because I think here in America, education is done at a state level. But she's really trying to do that through all the states, something at, at a federal level, just to really uh, focus on financial literacy because the way it struck her family, we, you know, we all have these things. It's when we go through it and have the experiences ourselves, that's when we know that things need to change and we can properly understand it. It was when her children came home from college with credit card debt because they'd been the victims of unscrupulous guerrilla marketing from these companies that were basically just hanging around on campus, handing out free pizza and as they were eating the pizza and wearing their free shirts, they would hand them a credit card with a 20% interest rate. And if you're a, a college student with free money, what do you do? You spend it. That's, that's it. You go and spend it. And then you get lumped with a big bill. So Sharon felt really disappointed, like she'd failed her family. And then her entire life, her mission, her purpose became crystal clear. And that was to create financial literacy for today's generation, something that she continues uh, to do to this day and is in the film and, and the book. How do we uh, kind of learn the lesson from her story? How can we figure out how to add value to someone's life today? I think, again, it really starts on, on getting clear on, on what you want out of life, who you are. A big thing that I love doing is the five-minute journal. I wake up first thing in the morning and it, it asks you what three things are you grateful for and what would make today great? 
And what you're doing with that is you're starting, it really gets your brain into gear to train you to start thinking about what value you're bringing to the day. Because as soon as you're in that right mindset, that's what really changes your interactions with the people who you're going to meet with that day. And when you're very, con- I think a, a really simple thing for people to do is take a really deep breath before any situation that is out of their comfort zone or is something that they really care about. Maybe it's a, an exchange with your husband or your wife, with the kids who haven't done their homework, whatever it might be. Take a really deep breath, close your eyes and think about, first of all, what energy do you want to bring to this conversation and this situation? And B, what outcome do you want out of this? And it's a very, very simple exercise. And once you've done that, you'll find that the the outcomes of, of these things is nowhere near as bad as what you want, uh, depending on how many teenage children you might have. It might be a bit more difficult. But yeah, really thinking about the intent that you want to bring to each day and then at more of a micro level, thinking about what energy do you want to bring to each situation, I think is a really simple way that people can start to live their life with intent and purpose. Yeah, for me, a lot of times, I, if I find myself in a, in a situation where I'm just trying to figure out what to do next, I, I often find myself, no matter what's going on, just taking a moment to stop and pray and just ask for help. You know what I mean? Because I think a lot of times we can get caught up in trying to figure it all out by ourselves you know what i mean and sometimes that can get us into some trouble so you know i like to just 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 like you said you know take the time i think that's another thing in this society we're just always on the go and notifications on our phone and emails and uh, work meetings and kids homework and cooking dinner it just never stops and we never stop we never take time to just kind of just chill and to find out you know what i mean what what am I supposed to be doing with my life? What is my next move? How can I make an impact on somebody's life today? So I, I love what you said about really just being intentional with taking it. Like you said, you, you, you journal for five minutes every day. It can be as little as five minutes, but it's an intentional five minutes. You know what I mean? That you're trying to, trying to figure out how to, how to take on the day. Definitely. And when you think about what most people do, so how do most people handle stress? All right, I need to stay at work longer to get through this. I've got a lot of work on my plate personal relationships, like that relationship with your spouse falls to the side. The relationship with your kids falls to the side because your biggest priority is working harder. You just keep going on this treadmill. But I tell you what, the one thing about work, there is always more of it. So think about what's really, really important in your life. That's going to be the relationships that you have around you primarily as well as your own health. And speaking of relationships, that was another big thing that I saw in pretty much all these stories was it was so huge for either from the, the aspect of the people that they network with or the intentionality with which they sought out mentors. Um, I forget. The, matter of fact, it was Bob Proctor. After he had made um, his fortune in business, he took like a lower paying job um, out here in Chicago and just took that time to really learn from somebody who was ahead of him. So talk to that, you know, the importance of being intentional with you know, networking from people on your level and even seeking mentorships from people that are levels above you. Definitely. And I think it's not just about levels above you. It's about different industries because we have a tendency to hang out with people who are exactly like us. They dress the same. They talk the same. They have the same interests. But if you want to succeed in an an industry, it's going to be very difficult if you can't get out of your own head and away from what everyone else is doing. So the ones who are the real disruptors are the ones who are able to bring information or a a strategy from a different industry and and just really think about the problem or the value that is being offered in a completely different way. So on the Bob Proctor story, he was able to create this big cleaning business that operated in, in multiple states in America and I believe Canada too and over in the United Kingdom. And then he went to, I think it was Earl Nightingale and Lloyd Conan in Chicago. He took a much lower salary than what he was on because he wanted to learn from these people. The mastermind principle, that is another principle of think and grow rich. That is the one that to me completely changed my life. It's It really is. You don't need to think, oh, all right, if I'm going to have a mastermind group, I need to get the president on the phone or, or someone at that level. You can do it with people around you. All they need to have, the, the very first criteria at the start, well, probably two criteria, there's maybe a few criteria now that I think about it, but leaving your ego at the door is very, very important. And the desire and the motivation to improve and see other people succeed. 
as long as you do those two things, as you start to grow and you're starting to send that energy out there in the world, you will start to attract what is going to help you get to where you want to go. Because again, those moments, like we talked before about people when they're overworked and stressed, they start to put their blinkers on and get away from the world. I do it. It's a very difficult habit to break out of. But the moment that you start to open that up and let other people shine in on your life, people want to help. They're just not sure how to. And then as you can find more and more people at a different level, at a, at a, that is when you start to focus on people who are higher up. Maybe you go and attend an event or a conference where someone who has already got the success that you crave and maybe they're, maybe they're a podcast host. You want to have your own podcast. So you might go to the event where this person's speaking, arrange a time to catch up with them. These are all the things that are quite easy to do. But I tell you what, finding a good mastermind group or a mentor will not find you while you're sitting on the couch watching Netflix. You need to get out there, get out of your comfort zone, get very clear on who you are, what you want, and find something that aligns with your values and your principles and something that you're passionate about. Policy Genius guarantees the best life insurance price for you and those you love. It's so simple to protect your family today in five easy steps. One, calculate quotes. Two, compare companies. Three, apply online. Four, receive expert advice. And five, rest easy. It really is that simple. Calculate, compare, apply with Policy Genius. For more info, head on over to hisandhermoney.com forward slash Policy Genius. Any advice on once you perhaps identify somebody that you might want to try and approach on, on about mentorship or try and uh, talk to about starting a mastermind, any advice on how to approach that conversation if this is you know, totally new territory for you? Yeah, I, I think the higher up the rung you go, you need to be very, very well prepared. And I think a lot of people wing it. They attend a conference, go, oh, wow, I've never heard of this person before. And then the person 350 in the huge line that's out the door and they expect them to be able to create a meaningful encounter. You're just not going to be able to do it. I focus on going narrow, but going long. So that means you have very, very, very good relationships with a smaller amount of people because then you're opening yourselves up to their Rolodex and people who want to get good at networking. I would read probably three books on that. The first one being Never Read Alone by Keith Ferrazzi. Uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie, and the other one is Influence the Psychology of Persuasion by Dr. Robert Caldini. These three books, if you read those three books and really study and absorb them, the next time you go to a networking event or any event, you will know that your desire and your objective is not to hand out a business card or to get a business card. It's to create a very, very real connection and another thing that people underestimate is being very, very prepared. If I'm going to an event where there's a chance that I might have an encounter with someone who could be, I could be a value to them or vice versa, I want to be very, very well prepared. So when I come up, I don't ask them some silly generic question that they have heard 500 times that week. I want to be memorable. I want to be looking at ways that I can add value to them. And I think if you're just looking at doing something with your friends, if you're, at a, if you're at a younger level, I think I was 21 or 22 years old when I started my first mastermind group. It was with three friends and we would just meet up in the boardrooms of the full-time, of the companies that we, we had full-time jobs. We had one guy who was in property, uh, another guy who was in uh, accounting, another one was in stockbroking. And we would meet up and we would just sit about what we would just sit around and talk about what was important in our lives. We had a, we would have a very clear agenda. We would have someone present about a, a company that they were interested in. Someone else would present about a company that might be interested if the group was going to buy shares or, or stock in this company. And after that, we would all pull names to, to, to conclude each meeting. We would pull topics out of a hat and we would have to talk for 60 seconds on whatever the topic is and we'd have a bit of fun with it so you might write ping pong ball so someone would get they'd pull ping pong ball out of the hat and they'd have to talk for 60 seconds on that but guess what that does you're so far out of your comfort zone it improves your public speaking abilities you're learning about these different industries and different companies it really gives you this eclectic and diverse knowledge so that when you do meet these people you can ask some things that they haven't heard before and they will remember you. And then you just need to focus on the follow-up 
adding value over time, connecting with people who maybe they have connected with. And once you do that, you should be pretty good. I think that's super interesting, the the concept that you described about how you started the mastermind with your friends for a couple of reasons. You know, we've been, Ty and I, my wife have been in a mastermind a few times, but it's always been kind of industry related. Like we were all in the same industry, all trying to figure out how to get better in that industry. But, you, you know, your situation was all you and your friends are all in different industries and you guys were kind of meeting up and finding mutual ground on how to be successful just in life in general. Am I reading that right? Yeah, absolutely. And we even had a, a one that we formed here about two years ago. How many of us? I think there's six people in the group, completely different, you know, completely different backgrounds. We had a guy in, in tech, another one who worked in financial insolvency companies, another person in entertainment, another person in commercial property, doing big property deals like shopping malls. We had this crazy mix of backgrounds and I still catch up with these guys. They're my best friends because we sit down there and we talk about what are our goals. Every year we sit down and we write out our goals and we share them. These are extremely comprehensive. They cover physical, financial, what relationships do we want to have. It talks about what we're going to achieve in three months, six months, one year, five years. And then we share that with our partners at home as well. I'm, I'm getting married when is it next week? I think it is. It's coming up coming up very, very quickly. But a really great thing for our relationship has just been the opportunity to share each other's goals because communication it's such a such a, an important part of a relationship. So yeah, I think the I do really see the value in in having a mastermind group of people who are in your field to help upskill each other on the condition that people are aware of uh, that it's easy to stay sort of in your own silo and your own bubble if you do that. And then there is a lot of value in in having other people, even if it's just for the friendships that you get from it rather than the, the professional expertise. And I think that um, it's easy to like kind of hear these stories, read these stories in your book. And by the way, we have links to uh, the, the book, uh, Think and Grow Rich, The Legacy, as well as the other books that James has mentioned that we should all read in the show notes of this episode. And I think it's real easy to kind of read these stories and be inspired by them, but focus on the end result and not necessarily look at the beginnings or even the obstacles in the middle. And I think that would be a huge mistake. And one of the stories that um, I liked a lot in your book was because I'm a fan of his, Grant Cardone. It's easy. It's so easy to look at his big super personality right now. If you, if you go to any of his platforms, but man, he had a hard beginning and he fought through a, a lot of adversity to get to where he is today. So can you kind of speak through how um, all these people that you've interviewed, a lot of them had situations that could have stopped them and the importance of not letting those obstacles that that we face stop us? It's like that very famous poster that I'm sure you've seen with the iceberg where it shows the tip of the iceberg hanging out of the water. That is what people see is what other people have done to enjoy their success. They never see the failures. They never see the hardship. They never see the hard work and hours and hours and hours of, of just work and persistence to make all this happen. Grant Cardone's story is, is really fascinating because the biggest theme from his is that you can take control at any point. Just because you happen to take a wrong turn doesn't mean that you can't turn around and go back. He lost three of his closest male mentors in his life growing up. It was his brother, his father, and his grandfather in, in a fairly quick succession. So there he was. He found himself at the impressionable age of 15. He was offered drugs at the age of 15 when he was in high school, and he took them, and he took them every day for the next 10 years. It was only when he was 25 he had a, a situation where he was beaten, violently beaten within an inch of his life. And then after that situation, he took drugs again and his mother said, you are no longer welcome in my house because she had, you know, by the time he, he had tested even a mother's love after 10 years of, of drug abuse, that was when he knew it was time. And he went into a treatment facility, a rehab, and they told him that he would need to forget his grandiose dreams of being successful and wanting to write books and have private jets and fancy cars and that he would need to continue taking a certain type of medication. And he was, his argument, which I, I think is fantastic and I completely agree with, was, hang on, I, 
I'm in here because I was taking this other drug, yet you guys want me to rely on this other drug for the rest of my life, and you want me to, to be comfortable with being average and living in the middle class. It just wasn't him. So he used that moment, and he just purely using the power of his mind, he's now created what, what is one of the largest private property empires in the country. He's got more than, I think, half a billion dollars as his net worth, and he is a, probably the world's foremost authority on, on sales and and property has all these different training things as the best-selling author of numerous books. But they were busy telling him that he was going to be a drug addict. That was his label for the rest of his life. And there's one thing that I really don't like. It is labels because people then associate their behaviors with that. So if someone had labeled him as a drug addict, uh, that would be him for the rest of his life. He said, no, I'm not a drug addict. I made a number of bad choices, but that doesn't mean I can't turn around and go back. Look at him now. Now, you've, you've helped a lot of people walk these principles out and achieve success. You've, you've personally walked these principles out and achieve success. What are three common habits or three not so common habits that people can incorporate today that can help them start to move in the right direction if they're on this journey uh, trying to get their lives to a much more fruitful place? I think of it, again, what I want to really focus on here, it's not trying to do anything complex or extravagant. What we're really trying to do is we're going to focus on the basics. We're going to do them well and we're going to do them consistently. I think the very first thing people need to do is uh, just create a goal sheet. That is the easiest way. There are millions of goal templates online. If you don't have one, email me and I'll send you 10 different ones so you can pick the one that works best for you. Start by writing your goals and get the person closest to you, who you care about the most, to do the same. They should be at a minimum willing to do that. If not, you're in the wrong relationship or friendship. Uh, after you do that, I think something like the five-minute journal is a really great way to help keep people on track. Leave it on your bedside table. It's something that you can do every day. Just to, to sort of reiterate what I was talking about when I mentioned it earlier, you write down three things that you're grateful for you're going to write down three things that would make today great. And then at the end of the day, you check in with those things. You talk about what amazing things happened today. And you just this is the type of thing. It only takes a few minutes to do. So I would focus on goal setting, the five-minute journal. And the third one is just getting out of your comfort zone. Really need to put yourself in these different situations. And there are a lot of – what Napoleon Hill tried to do was really create a bit of a linear formula for success so anyone can follow it. And anyone can follow it. But you just need to do it consistently. So focus on doing those three things uh, and celebrating your small wins and just really appreciate consistency. It's We're all our own, our own worst critic and it's easy to get down on yourself because you feel like you're not seeing the results of all the effort and the work you're putting in. But the results will come. Just focus on doing the work and the consistency. Focus on what you put into each day. Win the day is what I call it. Focus on winning the day, and over time, the results will find their way to you. Now, throughout this book, you interviewed a ton of people who have achieved a ton of success. Did anything catch you off guard or surprise you as a result of these interviews? I was, I was amazed. Another good question. I was amazed how uh, quick these people were to say that they're nothing special. They are all ordinary people, just like you and me and everyone else on this planet. They are ordinary people who... That's, that is what unites us. I think we're all ordinary, but that means we're all extraordinary as well. They were able to achieve these amazing things by consistently applying a set of principles. They didn't quit. But the thing that surprised me the most was just how consistently across the board they just viewed themselves as, as ordinary people. They're all just very, very, very tough. When someone tells them no, they don't listen because there's only one opinion that matters, and that's their own. That's right. And there's also, you mentioned earlier, there's also a Think and Grow Rich, the Legacy film, correct? Absolutely. It was a big crowdfund for it, the largest crowdfund of its type in history. Yeah, it's an amazing movie. It, it, it captures the, the principles very, very differently than what the book can because the, the book, by virtue of the medium, it can go into a lot more detail on these stories. But the, the director, Scott Savine, did an incredible job at making this very engaging and, and groundbreaking. It's, yeah, people, all the feedback has been amazing so far. Now how can people check it out? They can go to tgrmovie.com 
to go and check it out. It's available there. There's a whole heap of bonus content, extended interviews that, that haven't been released, the the audio book, the ebook, all this stuff has been uh, made available on there as well. So yeah, go and check it out. And it's a, for people who don't like reading, surely they can grab a bowl of popcorn and sit through a movie. So it's a very easy way to get started. And for those who do want to read and check out your awesome book, can you talk a little bit more about what they'll find in the book, where they can pick up a copy and how they can stay connected to you? Yeah, I think the easiest thing probably to do is just visit my personal website, James Witt. So J-A-M-E-S-W-H-I-T-T dot com. I've got links to the to the books that I've written there. Uh, also, you can go to Amazon and just type in Think and Grow Rich, The Legacy, or just type that into Google. It's available at Barnes & Noble, Google Play, all the major websites. And So we will have links to everything that James has laid out for us in the show notes of this episode. James, this was super, super great content that you delivered today. So thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to share this with our audience. No worries at all. Thanks so much for having me.